Wonderful. Hello there and welcome to today's ADA webinar, Psychologists in the Media. We have some great presenters here today who will be sharing their experiences. I would just like everyone to know that this webinar is being recorded and will be available as an on-demand webinar within 24 hours. So if you have any questions or need to hear a part again, you will be able to come back and view this. My name is Sasha Sicard, and I'm the Education and Membership Manager here at ADAA. I want to welcome everyone for joining us today and welcome our presenters. Uh, before we get started, I would like to go over a few items so you know how to participate in today's webinar. You have joined as a participant and as such will be muted for the duration of the presentation. On the screen here, you should see an example of the attendee interface. You should see something that looks like this on your computer or mobile device. You will have the opportunity to submit text questions throughout the presentation. You may send in questions at any time. These will be collected and addressed um, either at the end of the presentation or throughout the presentation. I would like to take a brief moment to welcome our presenters and give a little background information on them. Today we have Dr. Shane Owens, a board certified behavioral and cognitive psychologist and a proud father. Um, he specializes in the treatment of college students, young adults, and fathers. We also have Dr. Kristen Bianchi, who is a psychologist who practices at the Center for Anxiety and Behavioral Change in Maryland. She specializes in treating anxiety, depression, OCD, and body-focused repetitive behaviors. Thank you for joining us today, Dr. Bianchi. Uh, unfortunately, Kevin Chapman, Dr. Chapman, isn't able to join us today. Um, he is actually doing some media work today, so uh, we will touch a little bit upon that, but he um, is also an ADA member and the founder and director of the Kentucky Center for Anxiety and Related Disorders. And last but not least, we have Dr. Simon Rigo, um, who is the Chief Psychologist and Director of Psychology Training and Director of the CBT Training Program at Montefiore Medical Center. Um, thank you all for joining us today. I will pass over the presentation to them. Um, let them briefly introduce themselves and share their thoughts. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having us. I think we agreed that I would go first. Um, so actually, I'm still getting used to Zoom talks. You'd think after all this time, it would come a little easier. But all right, so as mentioned, this is just my bio <laughs> once again. Um, so I won't repeat that too much. Um, but in doing this talk, it, it was it was interesting trying to put slides together because I thought, you know, I'm putting together things that I've done in the media and this feels a lot like flexing. And so I, I think, which makes me uncomfortable and <laughs> makes me cringe a little bit. Uh, and so I, I guess before I, you know, I start and, and show you some of the things that I've done as will Shane and Simon, I, I want to make it clear. And I think that that's something we all share here is that these are things that everyone can do. If you want to do media work, you can. It's there for the taking. There are lots of opportunities and we will teach you a little bit more about how to get into this world if that's something that captures your interest. Um, so please know that I share these with humility and with the goal to, um, you know, with the tenor of the more the merrier, really. Um, okay, so let me show you, I, over the course of the pandemic, um, I've had the opportunity to do mostly print uh, work, mostly with printed media, meaning interviews in which I've been quoted. Um, I did also have the opportunity to do one um, TV interview, which I will show you. Um, it has not aired yet, um, and I'll speak more to that as I get to that slide. Um, but but most of what I've done has been has been printed. So here is the, the first example. Now, this particular article had a very grim theme. Um, I was contacted by someone at CNN to speak about existential fears and worries about dying alone. Um, and I was certainly you know, happy to speak to that topic. I specialize in treating anxiety. Um, but what was most interesting to me was that I spent good 60 minutes on the phone with this journalist. 
and really it ended up that there were only, as you can see here, really three quotes that were taken. Um, and so I, I share this because um, we don't ultimately know when we are interfacing with journalists, with anyone from the media, you really don't know how much of what you say is going to be included in any given piece. And there's really, at least in my experience, there's really not any way to ascertain that um, before it's published. And so um, essentially when, you know, when I do have the opportunity to do interviews, I know that it's it's probably going, you know, I'm, I'm gonna probably have to spend a half hour to 60 minutes on the phone um, and that it may or may not yield um, coverage and it may or may, they may or may not share, they're probably not going to share most of what, um, of, of the information that I provide them. Um, and I have no control over that whatsoever, but certainly the, the, my experience has been that the more reputable, the journalistic outlet, you know, the better luck I've had with regard to having being quoted correctly. And, um, that, you know, has been important. Um, and so in this instance, I, I talk more um, about why it is that we are afraid to die alone, why, um, why it is important to draw on community, et cetera. But I won't get into the weeds with the content there. Now for this one, I'm actually hopefully this will take us to the page. So this was another one. Now, now this, oh, I've reached my article limit. Oh, well, of course I did. Um, all right, well, let's see here. Yeah. Now, how do I transition back? See, I'm trying to teach everybody flexibility in addition to, I don't have any ideas how to get Are back. you looking to change what you're screen sharing? Um, I am looking to get back into Keynote. Um, I hopped onto the internet and now, oh, wait a minute. Ah, okay. There you go. Back. All right. Sorry about that. Um, so anyway, this one was very different. Um, so I got to spend an hour on the phone with a, a journalist, and the interview was actually the content for the entire article. So um, in in this particular instance, it was a totally different experience. Um, and for me, this has been less common. This is actually the first time that I had, you know, the bulk of an interview included. And so I, I was grateful to have that opportunity because I could speak at greater length um, around the topic of grieving. And, and given that there was um, and still is such a need to understand it better to understand what the bereaved are going through and what we can do to help them. Um, this this particular piece was one of the more meaningful that that I've had the opportunity to do in my career, which I think, you know, again, it speaks to how rewarding this work can be. So while on the one hand it can be a little hit or miss in terms of, uh, you know, what might be included when you do have the opportunity to really have um, your 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 thoughts um, put out there, you know um, that that can be worthwhile. Um, and it was it was helpful to have the opportunity to share this with people. And um, I got you know a lot of positive personal responses from people whom I knew, you know, many of whom were either grieving pre-COVID or or during COVID. So um really kind of special to to get a chance to almost do like clinical ish clinical adjacent work outside of a clinical setting now here and again i know this one this looks like what we they call in the pr world a slide unit <laughs> so a slide monument so i know that this isn't pretty but um here is an example of quotes that were pulled from a, an email interview, essentially. So um, it, if you get into the media world and start to establish contacts with different journalists, um, what, what one, you'll find that journalists are always looking for reliable resources, reliable sources in the mental health world. Um, and if you develop a relationship with them, if they, you know, like, uh, what you do, then they will continue to contact you. So this this particular 
woman, uh, Monica Torres, had reached out to me, and uh, because this was it, this was in Huffington Post. You know, it's a little, it's a less formal um, uh, medium, I guess we could say. Um, and so the that whole the whole interview process um, in in that case was done via email. And but what I liked about this, and what I like about actually doing. Um, I guess we could call them email interviews or submitting interview questions via email is that I, I do have the opportunity to one edit what I say and I can edit very carefully and even have somebody else take a look at what you know if I want another pair of eyes to verify accuracy. Um, and it seems as though in these instances, it really they almost copy and paste direct quotes which might be questionable journalistically, I don't know. Um, but but this was an example of uh, a typed exchange. Um, and again, here, it, it, again, another grim topic, um, you know, what to, I've covered death and dying and grieving, and now what to do if you're shiftless and don't care about work during the COVID pandemic. Um, but nonetheless, I, you know, was hoping to have the opportunity to really you know, use this platform to talk, one, normalize various experiences, but to engage people in a little bit of cognitive reframing um, and to also, you know, give a little bit in the way of coping strategies. So I do speak here to um, grounding oneself. So again, it's, it's just an opportunity to get some CBT out there, get a little mindfulness out there and all of that information. You never know who's gonna read it and it's pretty cool to be able to get, you know, if, if you get one or two like evidence based strategies for coping in an article cool I, I, I think that's great and I feel good about that. And then very lastly, um, here is a another one that was an emailed interview um, in which it, it interview questions um, let's see if this one works alright so this one um, was. Dr. Presented Oh yeah. Sorry, we don't see anything on the screen. Oh, you don't? Oh, okay. Well, I'm having a bit of a day here with <laughs> with going online. All right. So then uh, I'll describe it for you in um, <laughs> in as much as best I can. So so this one was actually an email uh, interview in which my responses were combined with those of three other two other mental health professionals. So there were three of us and it was put into a list format of do's and don'ts. And this one was a lot of fun too, because again, I had con I had I felt like I had a bit more control over what was ultimately said. It, it, it is helpful to be able to edit. But then it was also interesting to see, you know, when it was combined with content from other clinicians that actually some of what I had written in my own, you know, overlap generally with quotes that someone else had given. So, um, so it's nice, it, you know, it doesn't really matter whose quote they end up using, but to see that convergent validity in some of the recommendations um, was, again, a neat experience and very gratifying to see that evidence based strategies are being disseminated, even in a you know a, a a journalistic you know an online magazine that you know can be seen as a little a little fluffy um huffington post um but but to see that we've got you know again we've got cognitive behavior therapy in this in this online magazine and and that was really exciting so uh, last one all right and the good news is we do not have to go online because this hasn't been published yet anyway. Um, but this is the most recent um, thing that I did. I was asked to be on a TV panel for a channel in India and South Asia. And I have never had the opportunity to do anything like this before. I am not quite sure how, you know, where this channel got my name, um, but this one was, was tough um, because I could not actually see any of the other panelists and they did not give me any feedback ahead of time with regard to 
types of questions that they might be asking. Um, so I was really going in blind and most of our communication, it was really much more like doing a radio interview, but knowing that I was being filmed. So, um, you know, having to dress nicely and, you know, actually wear shoes, pants, all that, <laughs> all that good stuff. Um, and so it, it was a little difficult as well not to be able to see, you know, the nonverbals from the other panelists or to see the the uh, the journalist herself. Um, and again, these questions, you know, kind of came at me and they covered a broad range of questions. In fact, one question was regarding things that the US government or no, excuse me, recommendations for the government in India. And that, that was a tough one. <laughs> so I did the best I could. Um, I don't know, you know, we'll see what this looks like when it comes out, but it was, it was a cool opportunity and um, I was grateful to have been included. Thank you. Uh -huh. You should see the stop share. There we go. There we go. Okay. Uh, and Dr. Rigo, we're going to hand it off to you. Thank you. Yes. And uh, thanks, thanks to ADAA for putting on a webinar like this in the first place. And I'm, I'm glad to see we have people that are interested in the topic. And thank you for to Shane for for rounding up the cats. We, one got away, so to speak. <laughs> but uh, I really appreciate the invitation and and. It's nice to work with Kristen as well. And it was funny watching Kristen do her presentation. It's a great experiential example of what you do in this type of work anyway. It's like if something isn't going the way you planned, then you just kind of roll with it, right? And that was a great example of, oh, I, I'm out of my, I've exceeded my article limit, okay. Oh, and the, the screen's white right now, okay. And whether you're in studio or at home, something inevitably happens despite our best planning you get a question you weren't expecting, or they told you they were going to go one way and you go another, or someone knocks on your door in the middle of it all. And I guess it was very nice to see, like, that's the kind of nature of the, I think, the work nowadays is that there is a, an understanding, especially during a pandemic, that people are often working remotely, building their own makeshift studios at home or in some other location, and being able to roll with what's going on is a is a great skill to have and, and it was i appreciated seeing that in you kristen so kudos to you for for i know you set it all up i know you knew you had exceeded your article limit and and that the screen was white but you made it look so spontaneous so i appreciate that um, i'm gonna now try to see if i can share with you all a uh, few slides of my own here if i can pull these up which i now I'm having my own issues, of course. Let me try it one more time. There we go. There we go. Can you all see this? Give me yes, that. we can. Thank you. So, so uh, much like Christian, I won't. Re I won't repeat the the wonderful introduction that Sasha gave us. I just I'll just emphasize the the last piece for myself, which was which was really. Uh, the, the pleasure and satisfaction that I've derived over the years doing a media work. And I, I, I think it started uh, early on when I, I'm a PsyD, so I knew I was more clinically leaning and I'm not the, the most efficient writer. I'm too perfectionistic and OCD. So it takes me forever to write anything longer than a tweet, which is the beauty of it. A micro, a micro blog fits me, other, other things are way too long. And um, there's a great need in the public for consuming material that is scientifically based. And, and as Kristen alluded to earlier, uh, I have a few examples, but the, the, hopefully the, the meta message to everyone is there's still plenty of room for you all that are, that are watching and for others that may watch this in, in asynchronously later on in, in, the, in the video stream, there's, there's dozens and dozens if not hundreds of media outlets now all that that are publishing constantly on health and mental health and often it, it helps their stories if there's some quote unquote expert to lend some some facts or some opinions on be it an article that was published or be it an idea that someone has 
And just by virtue of the fact that you're members of the ADAA watching this, you have expertise that the lay public does not. And if you're approaching things from an evidence-based scientific approach, it's in the, the public really needs that, especially in an era of, of a pandemic with lots of stories and rumors and misinformation that exists on everything from what keeps us safe to uh, how the, the, the pandemic started to, to how we can get through it safely together and, and the sequelae on us. So, so there's plenty of room. And hopefully what we're gonna do is just wet your whistle a little bit and then maybe address some of your, your cognitions that may come up when you think, why me, okay? Uh, I, I put this disclosure slide up on because it, it, you're generally supposed to, but the, the ulterior motive here also is to highlight the fact that, that all of these opportunities that I'm disclosing are financial disclosures, which are, are paid consultant roles that I have or had uh, which I will contend came to me through the media work that I've done. It helped me establish a presence online that allowed companies such as the four on the, on the bottom of the screen when searching for someone to do consulting work with them to, to find me. Without a huge publication history, having a media presence helps level the playing field of branding yourself as an expert in both the consumer's eyes and the industry's eyes and can, can offset any investments that you might put in in the minimal costs that might get to get involved. So, so it's, it's another way to broaden your income stream if that's important to you, as well as potentially bringing referrals into your practice or bringing subjects into your research studies that you're doing. So although the, the, the main message I'm trying to send is that the public really needs educated, sensible people to, to translate the, the scientific journal publications into digestible sound bites, which back to Kristen's talk, I don't see the Huffington Post as fluff. I, I see it as, a, as a yet another avenue by which people might get appropriate information. And I'm often more readily than some of the places that we might see as more reputable. So I'm all for those. And, and I encourage you to think broadly when considering where you wanna get involved or how. And that speaks to the slide I wanted to stick in, which is from The Economist about four, four years ago, which was talking about the, the shackles of, of scientific journals. And here's the dusty journal. Right? And, and if I framed this talk, generally speaking, in, it, with the overarching view of what we've done during the pandemic. And you, but you could extend it to, in general, how we work in academia, but particularly for the pandemic, we imagine if we waited on the publication of clinical trials to start educating the public on what we know, it would be impossible because of the, the length of time in general it takes to, to design a study, get IRB approval to conduct the study, to gather the data, to analyze the data, to write up the data, and then to submit the data and often and then often resubmit. We're talking even in the era of electronic submissions, weeks to months, if not months to years. And we can't do that when there's a pandemic unfolding in real time around us. We, we wanna flex to what the latest information says and the latest facts from reputable sources are informing us and studies as they emerge. But the public was desperate for information quickly. And so, although maybe not COVID-19 specific, we know a lot from historical facts about how one deals with pandemics or loss of jobs or social isolation and things of that nature. And it does us a service, although it may not be exact to the context now, and we always have to qualify what we're saying in that context. If we waited, we'd be waiting forever. And in the interim, a lot of people would be suffering. So there's a, there's a place certainly for academic publishing. And I see another place equally as important as having people who are familiar with and competent to, to read the academic publications and then distill them down into, into sound facts that can be digested by the average person in the public that cannot read our scientific journals. That is a place for us to work in parallel with our colleagues that are more in the academic or research world. How do you do it? Well, there's, and I'm sure Shane and Kristen will have a lot of other ideas. I just wanted to give you two quick in easy ways to get started. This is, this is a, uh, the landing page for a website called ProfNet. 
And I, you might think of it as like a matchmaking service. On the left, there's experts, and on the right, there's journalists. And you sign up as one or the other, maybe sometimes both. So for our audience, you might sign up as an expert, log in, say what your, where your expertise lies, build a little profile, and you can wait. You will sit there um, in perpetuity, and then journalists who enter from their portal can do searches on experts for particular stories they're running based on your, your keywords or subjects or descriptions. Right? You can also go in and look for what, what are called queries that uh, journalists are posting that they're gonna run a story on subject blank and are looking for experts to weigh in. And so if, you, if you're more active and engaged in this and don't wanna be passive and just wait for an, a journalist to come to you, you can search what the queries are for the day or for the week and, and then respond to them, uh, uh, indicating your areas of expertise, and see if the journalist is interested in your take. Often, they're filed with a, with a relatively quick turnaround, as the media works on a very short cycle nowadays. So, it takes a bit more of an active engagement. But if you did the, the former and just build a profile and wait, that's okay. And then Profnet comes. The main site, I think, comes with a with a fee. But there's a Profnet light version that you can do for free if you just wanted to dabble in. It takes just a few minutes, just like match.com or eHarmony or whatever else there is. You can just throw something up there. The other one, which is which is equally well known, it's actually now owned by the same digital media company, I believe. It's called Harrow, help a reporter out. And it's it's very similar. You can enter in as a journalist or a source. And similar way, you can you can build a little profile, and you can sign up to get an email sent to you when a when a journalist files for a, a query for a particular story, and you can respond in real time, say what you how you could lend an angle to their story, and wait to see if you connect that way. So those are Profnet and Harrow are just two of, of of dozens of ways now that you can overcome any barriers in in, in reaching journalists uh, directly to either respond or to pitch stories or ideas or share your expertise with them. And both of these outlets are also on many of the social media outlets. So you'll find like a Herald page on Facebook or Twitter, LinkedIn, I would imagine. And so you don't have to go directly to their site. If you're on another social media, social networking source, you can find them there as well. I also just wanted to put a slide in. It's hard to read, so I will, I'll blow it up in a second. For anyone that is worried about being misquoted, I wanted to decatastrophize that for you all. Now, this is a real website, I suppose, blog that, that exists that quotes me from a story done many years ago, um, which was about teenagers and, and suicide. And I suspect what happened was I did an interview years ago that was translated as websites do into a foreign language. And then it was retranslated back and it probably pinged back and forth, but somewhere on the internet, this actually exists. And here is how I am quoted. I put in red some of the, some of the interesting quotes. Uh, most suicidal adolescents reported they had entered into remedying with daft health specialists. And it goes on to say, it apparently it is not yet esteemed enough at reducing suicidal thoughts and behaviors. And they quote me as captain of thinking training at Montefiore Medical Center, Albert Einstein College of Medicine. I, I actually like that title. So I'm not so upset about being captain of thinking training, but, but it's clearly, I don't think my hospital would appreciate that role that I've been given. And then lastly, it's, it, it is therefore also signaled to pressure, secure that mental health professionals, blah, 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 blah. Um, it sounds to me like I'm, probably either in a manic episode or in some sort of drug-induced fugue state. And it's out there. You can Google it if you, you can find it out. If not, I can send you the link. And that's probably when I first started this work, my worst case nightmare. What if I'm misquoted somehow? What if I get a, a fat, what if they say, what's the prevalence of panic? And I say it's 2.9% instead of 3.1%. My my colleagues will think I'm an idiot. I'll never get another referral. I'll probably get fired from my job. And, and if this exists in real time and I'm still doing okay, then hopefully you see it as it, it doesn't get much worse than whatever this gobbledygook is. 
And I've never written to them to try to say, can you correct it or take it down? Because I always feel good knowing it's out there whenever I take on a new interview. I did a couple, these are again, I'm not gonna show you in the interest of time. Um, they're out there, you, they're on, this one was to show you what a, a sort of more local television interview would be like. This was on, the Bronx has its own channel. I, I work at Montefiore, which is, which is in the Bronx, New York. They have a, a channel called Bronxnet and then uh, uh, Re Rena Valentin hosts this show called Open BXRX in which they talk about a variety of different medical or mental health topics. And she had me on for about 10 minutes talking about the impact the pandemic is having on, on people's mental health. And this was about a, a year in, so we framed it as still having the, a year in and a couple of months, how, how are people in the Bronx doing given March, April, May of, of 20, it was really the epicenter of the world in terms of the pandemic. And so it was, a, it was a, she's in her living room, I'm in my office, and it was a sort of low key, very conversational type interview that you can either find on Bronx that now, or it's, it's also as many channels do, it's, it's also living on YouTube. Okay, and then uh, right at the peak of the pandemic in our hospital in May of 20, so this preceded the, the open BXRX interview. Um, CNBC has a show with Tyler Matheson called The Path Forward. And Tyler invited me to come on to talk about dealing with the mental health fallout of the coronavirus as it was really happening in real time. That was obviously a much bigger platform. CNBC has a, it aired live. So there wasn't much wiggle room, whereas the Bronx that was taped. So we, we could do redos if necessary. This was live, let's go. And it was again about a 10 to 12 minute interview that still lives on the CNBC website if you want to see it. Or as is the case with the other one, there's also a CNBC website on uh, YouTube where you could Google appointment with a psychologist or Tyler Mathis in the path forward and, and dealing with the coronavirus and you find it there. I also did, I just gave you 10 these. I did a bunch of coronavirus specific interviews that appeared either in print or on the web or, or both. And just to give you an idea, much like, like Kristen hinted at, and which is what I come back to is, which is I don't see any outlet as, as, a, as a bad choice, as long as they will, will trust me with the facts that I give them. And, and over time I learn whether they, how they quote me, whether it's true to what we talked about. Those are good outlets. And I think the more broad you are, the, the, the better our reach as psychologists to transmit evidence-based messaging, especially around topics as sensitive as, as Kristen alluded to, when you have some death and dying or grieving or social isolation or drug use or suicidality. So I will say yes to almost anything. In fact, it's often the, our hospital that tells me no when I've already said yes, because I want someone to pick up or read the Huffington Post or to pick up Better Home and Gardens or Reader's Digest or, or Women's Day and see something that about CBT or about evidence-based treatments that may not otherwise hear about it. So, so I, I didn't show you examples of all these. These are all links you could follow or I'm happy to send you this if you want to get to them. But, I, but you'll see, I say almost the same thing every single time. So it's also quite redundant. I, I boil it down to a few bullet points about CBT or other evidence-based approaches and then how you can apply them to the topic of the day. And the pandemic is not much different. It's just more specialized. So with that, I will, I will stop here, stop my share and say thank you again and turn it over to Dr. Shane Owens to pick it up from there. Thank you, Simon. Thank you, Kristen. Thank you, Kevin in absentia for, for agreeing to do this. Uh, I will share my screen. I the right button. There we go. Okay. Okay. Here we go. What's over in here? Let's get a little better. Uh, thank you for being with us today. Um, I'm on my second week of this. I split this into two. Um, presentations on purpose so that we would get some outside perspective from a journalist and a physician. And I'll refer to that as, as I go through my slides. Um, I, I 
feel badly at the end because I am the least accomplished among all of us in terms of media. Uh, but I am intensely interested in it and I'm intensely interested in it because I believe that it is a way for us to change the public's behavior relatively simply. We can give a 15 minute interview and have hundreds of thousands of eyes or ears on what we're saying so that we can really make large scale change in things. It does not have to be two people sitting in an office or three people sitting in an office. Before I go too far, this obviously is not me. This is Kevin who is actually doing this work today. He let me know last week that he is on the hook for producers. And if you get really good at this work, that will happen to you. Your life will no longer be your own. You will be a psychologist, but you will also be a media personality. And media personalities, as much as it looks like they are in control of things, they are not the ones in control of things. Producers and assistant producers and showrunners and all of those people are truly in control of this. But here's a little bit about Kevin. I do feel badly he wanted to be here and, and he was very regretful that he was not here. I just want to give you some idea and I will share my slides too with you, which will include these and some other slides that Kevin sent to me if you get in touch with me. Um, so here is a list of some of the things that he has done. He, he really has done quite a bit of, of real TV work, documentaries and, and so on and so forth. And I wish he was here to talk about it because he has more experience in TV, I think, than any of us and can really talk about the pitfalls there. And I'm hopeful that maybe we'll be asked back to, to discuss this, and even have some ideas for a future presentation. Uh, I'm just going to skip through here and, uh, will come to me. I'm not going to talk too much about myself except to, to let you know the reason that I'm interested in this is not only as a, a, a producer of content and a giver of quotes, but also as a consumer. I think that we are all inundated these days with media in one form or another. So it might be social media, but any of us who watch any sort of cable news know that Cable news is the Wild West, and there are people who believe that some outlets are biased in one way or biased in another way. They're, we enter our own echo chambers when it comes to any of the big three, and I'm not going to mention any of their names right now because I don't want to give them any, any more attention than they need. But uh, I hope this comes up in our Q&A later on to talk about uh, going on those. I, I noticed that Simon has done some CNBC work. I've done some NBC stuff, but none of us, oh, Kristen did some, some print work for CNN, so, but has not been featured on any of their prime time. So I'm interested in talking to you about that in a few minutes. Uh, this is a little bit about me. I am also a, a consumer of this because I'm a father and I'm the husband of a psychologist who is concerned about whether we vaccinate our kids. This is the big thing now, and we're all, hanging on with bated breath about whether or not we should have our children vaccinated and, and at what age and is it safe and should we get booster shots and and while we don't have a necessary necessarily a direct effect on those discussions we do have conversations that are ancillary to that and talking about anxiety and talking about how to change people's behavior regarding things that we are coming to believe are healthy for us I, I do want to let you know in, in addition to doing media work I, I do a fair amount of writing uh, I did some blogs for ADAA, and these are all linked here, and you can and have a look at those at your leisure. Uh, it's interesting, ADAA is the only place that I have written for besides Smirconish.com, um, which is where How to Save Your Kid from Coronavirus Anxiety appears, although that they have changed the website, so uh, that is no longer available, but I can send you a copy of that as well. Uh, I just put this in here because we don't always have to rely on other people to to use our words. We can do our own blogging and things like that. And and you don't have to be a great writer. There are lots of tools that will help you be a, a, a good blog writer. And blogs really should be very short. So you don't have to worry about producing 500 word, 1,000 word articles in order to, to keep up with things. And I think it's important that we blog because we know that a lot of providers of misinformation and a lot of people who aren't quite getting it right are the bloggers who are filling up social media spaces with their information, which is not necessarily what we want people to hear. So I, I advise you to get into that if you're at all interested. Uh, with my trainees, I actually work on blogging and making sure that they're, they're able to do it, not only for their own private practices, but in order to be able to, to sell what we know to the public, because it's what public, the public really wants to know. 
They want to read things that can be read on their little handheld screen. And that's what this is about. As far as media appearances, I've done quite a few here. Uh, I'm just going to show them all to you at once and harken back to some points that have already been up. Oh, uh, some points that have already been made in terms of breadth. Um, one of the things that I'm very lucky as far as coronavirus was concerned, I got on the media train for coronavirus very early because my best friend is a, a quadruple boarded infectious disease specialist who works in New Jersey. He worked on the, out, oh, uh, the outbreak of Ebola in, in Africa and the people who came back from that and, and needed treatment. So he knew about this probably in the beginning of December of 2019. There were conversations on listservs about this really strange thing that was going on, and, and we're starting to see patients with this. And he's also a pediatrician, so I'm in constant contact with him about my children at three o'clock in the morning. So he's a great guy to know. And very early on, he and I talked about what was going to happen because he had studied the 1918 uh, Spanish flu outbreak. So he knew that some of these things were going to happen. And we had the chance to, he is the co-author on some of the things that I wrote for ADAA. And he got me involved with some of the press that was quoting him. And we really had a chance to, to try and talk to people about the anxiety that was going to come. I don't know if we stem the tide of any of that, but early on, I had the chance to talk to, to talk to the Wall Street Journal and to the Washington Post, which are the big ones, the ones that you really want to do. I never made the New York Times. I just cannot get them to pay attention to me. I don't know what I'm doing wrong. But we had a chance to talk about coronavirus anxiety and, and some of the things that we could do. And again, like Simon said, I, I wasn't doing anything brand new. I wasn't applying things that were that were groundbreaking. It was just applying it in a very specific way to something that none of us knew was, was going to grow to the point that it did. But we did have a chance to get our information in front of eyes of people who needed it, needed to know how they could handle all these things. If you take a look at this, and I know the, the slide is cut off, I think, by some of our faces, if you're seeing things the same way I am. But this is there is a, this list spans things. I mean, I never would have dreamed that I would be quoted on Shondaland, but the the person reached out to me because I I answered a Harrow query, and I am quoted there. And um, my my favorite ones really are the ones for Fatherly, and that's where you see Virginia Pelly's name. This is an interesting thing. Virginia Pelly in, initially contacted me because of a Harrow query that I answered for some article for Fatherly that that none of neither of us was really into writing, but she had an editor who assigned her this this article, and she called me, and I was I was in the car, and I was I was doing it as I was taking my daughter to dance class, and I apologized profusely for being unprofessional and not being sitting in my office and talking to her. And she said, it happens all the time. This is important. You don't have to be sitting in your office to do these interviews as long as you can get across what you need. She interviewed me for the article, and I, I gave her a 20-minute interview, and I had one line in the, in the article. And she contacted me, and she said, I'm really sorry. My editor just took out a bunch of the stuff that you said, and, and that's the way that it is. And, Sometimes the journalists do not always have control of, of their outcomes. And I, I expected to not hear from her again. I, I thought maybe she was just blowing me off. But then I answered another query for her on, from her on Harrow. And I said, listen, this is something that I do. My best friend and I, Dr. Sinemo, Dr. David Sinemo, I should say his name fully, he and I have worked uh, several times together on using motivational interviewing to have vaccine conversations with parents and families and children, not telling them that they need to do things. And, and this is this has been written about in the New York Times. Of course, they did not quote me, they quoted somebody else, but whatever, I'm not bitter at all. But she had this article that she was writing. So he and I both talked to her and we got a couple more quotes then. Further on in the pandemic, she, she contacted me because I was doing a presentation for the American Academy of Pediatrics on using motivational interviewing to increase vaccination. And this was, we had planned this well before COVID had happened. She contacted me again and we spent an hour and 15 minutes on the phone, by far the longest interview I've ever given. And if you, if you check that link, that article is basically what I said. 
like Kristen had where she had given the interview and it was just basically the content of the article. And I was really flattered. It was a lot of fun to do. We just sat and we talked and she quoted me directly a few times. Um, <laughs> she quoted me a couple of times where I wasn't necessarily happy with the way it came out, but I said it and that's the way that it was. And um, as a matter of fact, the first quote in there, I'm, I'm teasing you to go look at the article. The first quote in there, I, I sort of put my head in my hands every time I read it, but at the same time, it is what it is. But it, it, this, is a, a, this is a long list of things and it's by far not exhaustive of all the, th all of the things that I've done. But any chance that you get, you should take, I think. I think you should take any chance that you get. We'll talk a, a little bit about selecting uh, outlets in a few minutes because we're going to do our own Q&A. Uh, if you are not careful, uh, this is sort of tongue in cheek, or if you're lucky, print turns to other media. So very early on, a reporter from the Huffington Post contacted me for uh, a, an email interview. I like email interviews. I like email interviews because they usually give you a longer time to respond and you have total control over what you write. And that can be a double-edged sword because sometimes you, you email something and it doesn't come out right in, in the translation. But I almost never allow my email interviews to go out without somebody else taking a look at them, typically the much more attractive and smarter Dr. Owens, my wife. She reads the things that I write before I send them out because I have a tendency to say things in a way that I don't necessarily mean. But this was an email interview. Yes, we have warranty fatigue. No, that doesn't mean you can go out. And it was for the Huffington Post. And I sort of felt the same way. This is fuck. This is Huffington Post. Not only is it the Huffington Post, the person who wrote this is the senior lifestyle editor for the Huffington Post. Nowhere near mental health. I can't get the mental health and the healthcare people to pay attention to me at all because I, my my title at the college is not the highest title there. And private practitioners often are sort of not paid attention to as much as they should be because we're really on the front lines of things. But she reached out to me and I gave her a lengthy interview and it was great. She quoted me in a couple of places and not only me, but several other people. She does a very nice job of quoting practitioners and researchers and does tremendous research for her articles, which you would not necessarily expect from a lifestyle reporter. But coronavirus changed everything for everyone. And I think at last count, I've been quoted eight times by her. But this was the first time that I had an opportunity to do an interview with her. So I do this interview with her. She sends me the link. It's great. I put it up. People are, oh, Huffington Post, that's great. I have some people in my family who believe the Huffington Post is not only fluff, but might be a little left-leaning for them. I, I have a, a somewhat conservative family. But they read it and they thought it was great. Well, all of a sudden, I get a call from a reporter for the NBC in the Bay Area, in San Francisco. I'm on Long Island, nowhere near San Francisco. But she read what I had said, and she had done her own informal poll on Instagram about whether people were violating rules as far as the quarantine was concerned. Are they going out? And, and she wanted to speak to somebody. And all of a sudden, I was sitting in, I think I was in my living room in my house with my laptop propped up to just the right height, even with my nose and correct lighting. And I gave this interview. I will not play it for you because I'm, I'm not so happy with it. it. The content is great. I just think that I look a little silly. But you will. It, it's linked there and you can and bask in my very red-faced glory. As a matter of fact, that's what my mother said when I sent it to her. She said, oh, Shane, you were great. I, I, I thought you really came across very well, but why were you so red? And it is at this point that I, that I learned that one of the things that you must do if you're going to embrace TV work is get used to, even if you were a man, makeup and powder. You must make yourself up in order to look better for TV. Yes, even men need to do that. So. Uh, and it, it happened because someone read my stuff someplace else. I have not gotten the consultant deals that Simon has gotten from it, but it, it does do something for you. People will come to your practice expecting different things from you if you've been quoted in the media and things like that. But I, the reason that I do it is so that I can get what I know to be true about our lives and about 
behavioral and cognitive therapy and about therapy in general to the public so that they don't have to pay a copay and come in and see you. I'm not offering advice, I'm offering information, but I'm, I'm doing it in a way that reaches larger audiences. And I think we all agree that that's, that's really the, the crux of what we're doing and why it's important to us. Okay. At this point, we intended for this to be interactive and for people to, to offer their questions and answers. And, and Simon and Kristen and I came up with some questions that we'd like to talk about with one another. So uh, I'd like you to submit your questions on the, through the Q&A and uh, Sasha will take care of curating those. But of course. after hearing what all of us have had to say, do either of you have something that you'd like to open with? I have the list of your questions, but, and I have some of my own. I'm gonna stop the screen share because you don't need Q and A to come up. I'm happy well, for you wait. to go ahead, Shane, and, and, and see what's on your list. Okay, I, I, I'm, I will uh, let Sasha do those. My, Simon, you said something interesting. You said, I would very rarely, almost never turn down an interview. And um, this is something that, that came up in the conversation that we had last week. Are there cases in which you would not take an interview and what might those, those instances be? And, and I have a follow-up and I'll, I'll tell my own story about. If this is, I mean, if this is for me, I, I'd be eager to hear what Kristen says as well. Uh, Again, I, I stay true to what I said, I, and to touch base on something you alluded to in your presentation, I have appeared on CNN in a segment, oh. and I and I've also appeared on Fox in several segments. So, so may I, I ask, may I ask Fox National? It was uh, no, they were all they were. It was you know what Fox does. So it, it films in one of the Fox studios is in Manhattan, mm -hmm. and what they do. Is, at least what this producer did, who, who I really clicked with, who was a real mental health advocate is, she brought me in, pro I probably five to seven times over the course of a year or two, uh, her name is Maureen Conway, and she's still there for Fox, but the pandemic shut things down. And she would do a piece, and what Fox does is they do the piece and then they upload it to a server where any of the local affiliates can run the story as part of their Fox News hour. So, it, would, it was one centralized taping in studio and then it gets distributed around. And, and so I honestly, like I would occasionally get news alerts. Oh, it appeared on Fox 13 in Tennessee and then it appeared over here in Ohio. But so they were, it was really aired locally but it was filmed for like an, anyone in the national database of Fox affiliates could access that. And the CNN was, uh, it was a while ago, but it was a national broadcast, and it was on a, it was on like psychic soothsayers. So it was a really, really <laughs> fringy topic. And I don't even remember the host's name, but it still exists on CNN, and you can see it if you want. But to get to your question, uh, more often than not, and this is one caveat for people who may have academic affiliations. Shane hinted at private practitioners or people, although I disagreed with with lesser titles. Uh, I think your titles sound just fine to me, but the but if you are affiliated with academic or medical institutions, they often have uh, media relations and or public relations departments. And mine has, at Montefiore and Einstein, we're the teaching hospital for Albert Einstein College of Medicine. We have two sets of PR divisions and MR divisions because they're, they're in the process over years of consolidating. So when I get a request, which happens now, people reach out to me directly, I have to go to my Montefiore and Einstein media relations departments. Usually that's enough, but sometimes the public relations departments as well and, and have them vet the request. And they more often than I, I would say, this sounds great to me. Let me just run it by my PR or MR department. And then they come back to me privately and say, you can't do that. And most often it is because they have, they have ways of looking at the potential reach of the program and they would say knowing what Shane and Kristen have said like if you're going to invest 20 minutes 30 minutes of your time often it may not be worth the investment if it's a smaller audience I may disagree with them but there I have to get it approved that's part of my employee agreement or 
and this is an advantage of having an MR or PR department, they've had someone on a show uh, from the same uh, outlet and it's turned out poorly. It may not be a mental health expert. It may have been someone from another area of the hospital, but they'll say, we've sent someone to them before or they've done an interview and it really did not represent the, the provider well at all. So we, we, would, we would turn it down. And so those would be times when I would, I would for the former, I would, may disagree with half the list and the latter I'm actually quite appreciative of because I, it's, it's a way of not having to learn through, a, through example by, oh, they really misrepresented me, it's too late. So sorry, Shane, that's a long-winded answer, but those, that's, that's what I would say. No, I appreciate the long-winded answer. I'm interested in what Kristen has to say. With regard to would I ever turn down? Yeah, what might be conditions under which you'd turn down an, an interview? Gosh. Well, I, let me preface this by saying that I have been very lucky in that I have never felt conflicted about doing interviews with anyone um, who has approached me. Under what conditions? You know, perhaps if the organization itself supported general practices that were unethical, um, human rights violations. Um, I say that, uh, and and then I am, you know, as I'm saying this, I, I'm I'm thinking, well, how well am I doing my homework? You know, if you dig deep enough in any media outlet what will you find and I, I you know i'm not vetting every um you know every outlet that has contacted me um but but that is what comes to mind perhaps if an organization made it very clear that as part of their mission their values posed an, an ethical conflict if if for example they I, i'm you know sanctioned um, discrimination of, of different types, then I would, you know, then I would decline. Um, but that's, that's what comes to mind for me. For the most part, I like, as Simon said, I'm pretty open. And I think it's a really, um, it's great when you can have your voice, um, you know, have have your ideas reach a wider audience, especially because we do have this opportunity to provide scientifically accurate information to people who might not in, in, in particular news outlets, if they're if they're skewed, you know, if they're heavily biased, might not have access to that. So that that I think is a real opportunity. I, I'm glad you said that last part, because that's the important part for me. I, I have colleagues who will not go on certain television stations and just will not uh, and and will not give interviews to certain hosts and things like that hosts are a little different I, I there are probably a couple of hosts who if they called me i would i would think very carefully about what i did um and i'll, I'll share a story that that david told or he and i were both present for it uh, we went to brunch on the day before the the sunday before the pandemic shut everything down and we went to brunch in the city the weekend after they opened things up for dining and, and we were sitting and having brunch in an empty restaurant. No, it wasn't empty because there was a Rangers game that day and eventually it filled up for about 15 minutes and then everybody scattered. But, but we, as we sat and we talked, he picked up his phone and he, he first looked sort of perplexed and then started laughing. And he, I said, what? He said, apparently a, a Fox host, which will remain nameless, misquoted him or or took a quote that he had given to New Jersey, New Jersey advanced media and misappropriated and and had called into question some of the the physicians and experts who were in charge of masking who and it did not reflect ac accurately what he was doing and what he was saying in the original article so uh, he, he we laughed about it and it's out there but they they said who he was and he had not given that interview to that particular host and that that makes me think I probably would not go on that show but at the same time if they called me up and said listen we want you we want you on and I thought that I could comport myself in a, such a way so as to provide evidence-based information and and not 
get skewered or not have my words taken out of context, I would think seriously about that. Uh, Farmingdale does have a media relations department, and this is interesting. When I give an interview for farming uh, that specifically about college mental health for Farmingdale, I do go through their media relations department and ask them, although it's it's not it's not nearly as fleshed out as as other places. When I do private practice things, I, I give the interview. And if something happens and Farmingdale finds out about it, then then we handle it at that point. But nothing that I ever say goes into any political realm. As a matter of fact, one of the things that I that I stick to is I avoid politics in all senses of the word. I just do not get political. And if someone tries to take politics, pulls politics into things, I, I just shut it down. But that means that I can go on any of these networks and speak my mind, even if it's skewed politically. As a matter of fact, very early on, one of the things that was interesting to people about me was that I would come on and talk about how to have a political conversation about masking and about how involving politics in masking and vaccines and all of those things actually sets us back. Because if you're going to turn off half the country with being associated with one side or the other, you're, you're going to get no herd immunity and you're not going to get people wearing masks so i'm glad to hear that we're all of the same mind in terms of giving those interviews there are probably a couple places where i wouldn't go um kristen you alluded to this how do you how do you prepare for interviews if if someone if someone contacts you for an interview, do you vet the source? Do you go back and see what else the person has written and, and what their style is, or do you just do the interview? Um, it honestly depends on how much time I have, to to be honest, because as, as Simon mentioned, often the media are working on a very on very short deadlines. Um, so when I have the opportunity, I will look at you know a few things that they've written just to learn a little bit more about them, um, I'll do that if I'm interviewed by phone. Um, it, it typically with email interviews, I feel a lot more comfortable um, because again, my experience with those has been that they pull direct quotes and you know, again, I um, get more of a chance to edit and have other people look at it. Um, so that's, so the answer is sometimes I will prepare, um, but I am more interested in, you know, any prep work that they ask me to do. So I, I may not so much vet them as be working on, um, you know, thinking about the questions if they give me notice ahead of time that these are the things we're probably going to be talking about. Um, this has happened for for radio before. Um, usually they'll give yeah some things to think about ahead of time. And um, so that's where the bulk of my prep work lies. How about you, son? I think I'm, I'm probably the same. I think in part it's due to, to just the busyness of life lately. It's, it's, I remember the very, the very, very first interview I did when I was in my postdoctoral year for, a, it, it still exists out there somewhere. It was like an article a writer was doing on scrupulosity in the, in the Jewish community in OCD. I think it's called sleeping with pork or something like that. And it's out there. And, and I remember freaking out. And I, I probably put in hours of prep time to make sure I had all my facts. And it was a phone interview. And so I had post-it notes all over the place. So I could, if I was, re I was ready. And it turned out to be so different than that, that I think it over the years, I've, I've, if I know the gist of what the topic is, if it's very specialized, I might prepare some some ideas. But if it's if it's a topic I'm somewhat familiar with, and and I know I'm going to be doing my thing about CBT or or evidence based treatments, the the one thing I try to do is in in media work and in political work, you often see this notion of what's called staying on message or staying on point, which is basically if I if I had my way, which I try to have, what are the three bullets that I want to get across no matter what they ask me? How am I going to pivot the conversation to sneak in a little bit about there are psychological treatments that work? CBT is one of them. It deals with that. Those sorts of things, I, I think, okay, for this person, this outlet, if I walk out of there, what are the three things I want to make sure I convey? And I rehearse those. And then I think, how will I pivot into them if it's not going in that direction more than necessarily content because I just the last thing I'll say is it's okay to not know and especially in the pandemic it, we don't have we're, we may be an expert in certain areas but we're not an expert on everything and it's out of your scope of competency or you don't remember something 
it's perfectly fine to, to be to be uh, to, to say I don't know or to flex back and say I can find that out and let you know, but I'm I'm not sure. So I prepare my messaging more than the topic, if that makes sense. That's good. I, the journalist that we had on last week, we we asked that question of her: Is it okay to say I don't know, or is that is that going to destroy my credibility as a source? And she said, Absolutely not. I I we want to hear that you don't know. And, and, back to the, the work that I was doing early in the pandemic, I think that we needed scientists to say we don't know more often, as a matter of fact. I think if we had accurately expressed uncertainty, then we would have sold the case better for, okay, you know what, now we think that masks are good, things have changed. You know, vaccines we know have this. So uh, we should say, I, know, I don't know, probably more often. This brings up a question for me, and I know that Chris and I had, had talked about um, ethics and and I had asked about ethics and and ethics as far as doing media work it it is important that we behave ethically when doing media work and I don't know as a big part of that but there are, there are some other concerns I'm just wondering if either of you would like to speak to the ethical concerns that that exist when doing media work one thing that comes to mind for me with is you know occurs with television and i'm thinking specifically non-journalistic tv i i don't think you know and again i don't have extensive experience it's a, it's a bummer <laughs> that that kevin isn't able to join us today because he he could you know speak in much greater depth to this point but just recognizing that if if you are doing something that is recorded that's non-journalistic in nature um it, it truly you cede all editorial control. Um, so you really truly have no idea what is going to be on, on film, on camera. Um, I had an experience in which I was introduced as a therapist to someone who could potentially have been a patient. There was no clinical relationship there. Um, but I you know, knew nothing about this person and um, it, they took out, ooh, I want to say 90% of what I said and really kind of made this whole piece much more about this person's, the challenge that was being featured um, as a sob story uh, and less about resilience. And that was heartbreaking to me. I, I you know, um, it was eye opening. That wasn't at all what I had hoped for. Um, and if I had to do it again, I wouldn't. Um, so I would just but but that said, right, I think that that's where one has to, you know, be careful, exercise caution, do a little research, talk to other people who've done this kind of work to find out more. Um, and, um, and that certainly doesn't mean that one should turn down those opportunities either. I think it's more um, about recognizing what you're getting into. And then, you know, it, if you can ask questions ahead of time, um, that's possible. But then also just acknowledging, you know, taking this radical acceptance stance of it's really, truly out of your control. Um, you know, uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, that's, that's what I would say about that. Simon? It, I, I just briefly, I feel very this, very much the same. I, I, um, I tried, I try to steer away from from shows or requests for interviews that come with a request to also bring along a patient. Um, again, in, in thinking of our ethical guidelines, I'm trying to protect patients, former or current, that I've worked with, unless they explicitly tell me I'm finishing that they they're interested in in helping others by by spreading the news. And even then, I'm a little reluctant because I'm. I never know when they may need treatment again or shows that say, we, we've got this patient, will you come on and treat them? I did, I did, I did two episodes of hoarding of animals, animal hoarding on, on, I think it was on Animal Planet. And for much the same reasons Kristen said, it's, it was a day of taping that they boiled down into a 45 minute episode with, with no editorial control. And, and I felt very uncomfortable as I do often with, with other things like taste conferences, trying to demonstrate CBT with a stranger without doing all the things that we do as good CBT therapists in terms of building rapport and doing an assessment and, and, and building a formulation. So I, I feel very uncomfortable when asked to, 
not because I don't mind demonstrating the techniques, but when there's a real person on the other end, I'm, I'm confidentiality and patient, protecting patients' rights who are in a vulnerable place, I'm, I'm vigilant about. It's also important to practice within your competence. I know that sometimes people have gotten into the trap of, of okay, we need a psychology expert and they don't, they do not necessarily ask what you're going to ask them about. And, and they end up in a position where either they don't give the interview because they were being asked about something outside their area of expertise, or, or they make the mistake of pretending that they have expertise or, or talking, not necessarily beyond their expertise, but giving some quotes that are not necessarily on point as far as those things are concerned. You know, if someone, if someone contacted me about major mental illness, I would have to say I, I don't have experience in major mental illness, anxiety, depression, things like that, college student mental health, which touches on that a little bit, I, I will comment on, but the, the area of the, the competence in, in your area of practice is a very important part of what you do and not speaking out of turn. So do we have any questions from the audience? Sorry. We do. I was kind of just waiting uh, to pop in. So we have a question um, regarding kind of interviews for early career mental health professionals. They wanted to know the best way to document your involvement in these stories on your CV um, and whether you should kind of focus on more well-known outlets or how would you portray this information? I can tell you how I do it because I lifted my slides right from my CV. Every time that I give an interview, I my CV is set up with tables and you know all the lines are hidden obviously but it, it's basically the title the outlet who wrote the article I love to give journalists credit anytime I can because they are our partners in it and then I include a link in case the the person is reading my CV online in, in terms of in terms of getting into it at the ground floor as long as it is an outlet that you're comfortable with and seems reputable I would I would take it I would absolutely take an interview and, and do it. And I think too, don't underestimate your fund of, of knowledge as a grad student. You are, are coming as an early career psychologist. If anything, you have access to the cutting edge, the latest, the newest. And so I think, you know, as Shane said, absolutely go for it. Your voice is very much needed. And, and I would add that, uh, first of all, you, you're a psychologist. You, you have a PhD or a PsyD or EDD. That puts you in a very select group of people of higher education that it, it can be easy to, to have an imposter syndrome or compare up. But you have a, already just graduating, you have a, you've consumed a, a bunch of knowledge that a lot of people don't have. And um, I, don't, I used to put these on my CV. Now I just, I, I have a, I have a media section where I just list the number and I sometimes categorize by by the big ones like television, radio, and then print, be it be it online print like websites or or the old school print like newspapers and magazines. Uh, and but my website is like my living CV. And on those I have, although it's a bit dated, I, I get behind in them sometimes. I have links as Shane described with every article so that they can point people to the actual source where they, they appeared. And then ideally the crediting the journalists also builds a reciprocity where they, they find you or they come back to you much like Shane said, it can cascade and outlets copy one another. So to that last point, I don't think there's an outlet too small. And in part, it's what's your mission. There's, there's oftentimes when a local outlet might do you better than a major outlet. Like for example, in New York, we have this newspaper that they hand out in the subway the Metro newspaper and it gets 8 million riders at the subway. That's a freebie. If you get in that and you have a practice in New York and then can plug your practice, that's to me much better than a national outlet, which may reach people in places that, that don't care as much. So it's thinking of also about what, what, what's your function and why, what's your role in doing that. I used to grab that newspaper and loved it all the time when I rode the subway. <laughs> um, what do you think uh, the role of social media plays in this and should you have a social media presence does that impact uh your work in terms of the media 
Simon and I talk about this all the time. I think I think Simon and I have given so many presentations on that we pro probably can read each other's mind. The answer generally is yes, you have you should have a social media presence. Um, I will tell you that you have a social media presence, whether you have one or not, because someone is taking pictures of you and tagging you and all of those things. You should take control of it as soon as possible so that you can, you do have editorial control over everything that you share on social media. It is a very useful tool. It can also get you into some trouble if you don't take care of it and handle it. Um, Simon and I, and, and I don't, I don't know if Chris has had this conversation with us, but he and I both believe that part of graduate school should involve a class that teaches you these things and social media power, uh, the power of social media and etiquette and ethics and things, because it is a part of everyone's life. So it, I, uh, I, I will say it, it, I have a social media presence, which basically went dark once the pandemic started. And the reason is quite simple. I had two kids and they were homeschooled all of a sudden. And so I was custodian and, and teacher and lunch lady and all of those things. So I had to, to back off of that. But yeah, it's an important thing. Fine, Kristen. I, I would agree. I, I wouldn't necessarily say that it's imperative per se, but I think it's a great, it's a great idea. Um, and it is a, the social media world um, is a very inclusive one. There, there's a wonderful group of mental health professionals out there. Um, there are hashtags, um, including uh, one that Shane created, the hashtag S so me Sykes. Uh, we can, well, I don't know how to use a blackboard on here, but um, there's another one that's at CBT Works. Um, and and so these 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 hashtags are incredibly useful in you know helping you network um helping you link up to you know to share content that um it, you know is important to you um and to share your own content in such a way that it can get more broadly disseminated um and so i i would absolutely encourage it again it's another way to do outreach um it, you know, community outreach. We don't, uh, you know, we tend to not think so much about the idea of online outreach, because when I think of community outreach, I think about presentations um, to audiences. Um, but we have a real opportunity here. And um, between that and the community element of it, um, it's, it's a lot of fun, it's enjoyable, and it's also low pressure. So if you need to take a break, um, as Shane mentioned, I have also gone pretty dark on social media, um, at least on Twitter, you know, for similar reasons, just being really, you know, in the weeds clinically and focusing more on actually direct outreach with regard to presentations and um, uh, other, other things like that. But that world will always be there. there. There'll always be a need for sources. You can come back anytime. Um, it's it doesn't, we're, we're not, none of us are important enough to get canceled. Um, so I, I know that that is something that people have voiced concern. They're like, well, what if you get canceled? I'm like, well, I don't have enough followers, one, and I, my voice isn't, isn't that important. So I, I think, uh, you know, by and large, it is this welcoming space that we strive really hard to keep safe and um, that, you know, I think there's some implicit trust there among members. So that was a long winded way of saying, yes, please join us. Yeah, and I, and, and I just echo what's been said. It was almost hard to frame this talk without talking about social media. I, I struggled in my slides to keep, keep social media out of it. So there, I, I, I'm a, a big proponent as, as Shane and Kristen are. I think you can start very small. If it feels overwhelming, there's, there's so many different apps now to, to potentially consider that it, you could start with one. You should know the risks. There are, there are risks in, in doing it as well. So, so and there's, there's a literature, a scientific literature around risks and liabilities to, to and ethical considerations when in, engaging in social media work and media work. Um, so you can consult that. And, and one of the ones that I like often distinguishes between um, digital immigrants and digital natives. And depending on your age, 
<laughs> the, the digital natives may be much more comfortable with, with what happens when you post versus the sort of digital immigrants that are moving over to it that don't understand necessarily what happens when you click send or post. So it's good to, to study it and, and know what, what, the, what could go wrong so that you're prepared and, and have a clear lens about whether it's for you or not. And, and then if so, I, I really like the idea of looking where the, to use a Wayne Gretzky quote, he was a hockey player, to sort of go where the, the puck is headed, right? So you, I usually look for where I, I ask my 14 year old niece what she and her friends are, are doing or using and set up a shop there. Even if I never do anything, I, I take a name that's, that's hopefully easy to remember and reserve a spot. Just to, some of them become duds, but some of them take off. And then you have at least a placeholder to engage audiences that again, might not always think about mental health in their lives. And if, if you're into child and adolescent work, I, I think there's a lot of space in the social media landscape to reach kids who could use positive messaging and, and scientific based ideas and approaches that wouldn't get it anywhere else. It, it, this brings up a question that we had talked about. How do you handle people who are trolling you on, on social media? Uh, and I'm interested in how people do handle that and how they believe that should be handled. Well, <laughs> I guess it depends on how one defines trolling, but uh, <laughs> I, <laughs> if, if we're talking low level shade, um, that might be a little different, but um, with regard to true malicious content, um, I will block people and you, there is a function, at least on Twitter, wherein you can you can report someone for nefarious content or I forget the the designation um I also that you know typically with regard to social media often you know threads get developed and I've I've seen people take cheap shots at other psychologists and I've seen people understandably get upset about that we're humans and it's unkind um but what also tends to happen is that that stuff gets buried and people's attention spans are so, so, so short. Um, I'm a little obsessed with Ricard, uh, with uh, Ted Lasso right now. Um, so I'm not even sure we have the, the attention spans of goldfish at the moment, given how saturated we are. So while um, it's something to think about, there are mechanisms built into every social media outlet that would allow for you to block someone and to report, you know, behavior that's that's really not acceptable and, and really shouldn't has no place on on any format. So that, that would be my advice. Yeah, I, I'm watching the time. So I'll just say briefly, I, I ignore I, 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 uh, I find it. And then often the nice thing is, in if you built a good following of people, they jump in sometimes and take it on your behalf. But if not, I I think in any form of, of public work, be it artists or 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 scientific work or or media work, you have to be prepared for people to disagree or not like what you're saying, and that's okay. It, but engaging people, I find, often amplifies the 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 very thread, as as Christian said, that you you if not given attention to, would sort of wither out on its own. So so. Like I think a lot of people say who are, who are much bigger than me that you just don't don't get attached or, or accept that people will, will think I, I disagreed with Shane earlier about the makeup idea because I think even if I did a full makeup job people would still not necessarily like the way I look so I, why bother with the effort it's no matter what you try to do there'll be someone that disagrees or dislikes it or, or is just in a grumpy mood or who goes about life trolling so if you can accept that and I my stance is ignore it and let it let it die down. I, I occupy this odd space where um, m many of the people who are close to me disagree with the things that I said about coronavirus and masking and vaccination. Uh, so I, I get trolled by my own family and friends. And basically the way that it is, I, is I just say, listen, you know, this is, this is what I know and I care about you and, and move on from it. But I have gotten some, I've gotten some emails 
that were pretty critical of, of my work. And I, I, I take it as a compliment, as the gentleman says in Wet Hot American Summer. I, I know that I'm reaching people and I know that I'm doing good work and that's just the way that it is. I do want to get to one last question because if you take a look at my, uh, my um, media interaction in the past year, you'll see that there's a big there's a big stop. I, I basically did a bunch in the beginning and then I stopped. Kristen had asked the question, is it okay to take a break from this? Should, should you take a, a mental health break from this kind of work? And I'll tell you, I did. I, I, I stopped. And I, as a matter of fact, this is, I had decided that this was the point starting tomorrow. I'm going to get back into it. I'm going to put my name out there. I'm going to contact journalists. I'm going to comment on things to try and get some attention to, to move forward with this. So but it was Kristen's and I'm and answering her answering her question. Go ahead, Kristen. Oh, I, I, absolutely. Um, and I, I think I spoke to this while you had had to step away. Um, Sorry about that. But, oh, no, no, that's okay. That's all right. Um, it, uh, but, but of course you can take a break and, and we have that ethical imperative to take care of ourselves. We, we can provide the the media world is always going to be there. It's not going away. The need for our um, expertise is going to continue to be there. And most importantly, the community of professionals, the lovely network, is there. And it, again, it's a it's a very welcoming space. Um, and they'll they'll welcome you back. So I, I haven't been on in a while either, Shane. You know, as you know, and you know when go on when it's fun for you and when you have capacity for it, when you're available, take a knee when you're not. Um, but it can be a fluid thing. It doesn't have to be an all or nothing phenomenon. It can be part of your life in an ongoing way as much or as little as you can accommodate it at any given point in time. It, I, the only uh, the two quick things I'll add. One is that uh, the, you, you'll never miss the bus. The, the, the bus is on a loop. If you, if you you just have to stand at the bus stop when you're ready and the bus will pull up because there's there's news is everywhere and it's it's as the as the public's cons consuming of news has shifted from traditional media to social media and online media there's more and more outlets that need more and more stories with more and more experts so i don't worry about about missing the bus on that one and, and then the other piece is in social media work it's it's sort of different than traditional media work in which you're uh, you're really interacting a lot. So you can take a break from from being in the spotlight and just support your colleagues through. If you're on something like like Shane and I are, and and Kristen are all on Twitter, and you don't have to generate your own content. You can see something you like by your like Shane or Kristen and just like it or retweet it and or by a journalist who you worked with and retweet their stories that you support and. It, people like that because you're helping them echo their messaging and it's relatively low energy to do. And if you, if you have things that are distracting for you, there are, there are other platforms that allow you to do things like pre-schedule stuff you want to send out there. So you don't have to do it in real time. I have a, a, two different ones I use for free that when I see something that I stumble upon, I just set it up automatically and it, dicti it dictates when it'll shoot it out across my social media platforms. And there's a bunch of ones like that that do the work for you so that if you are low energy or distracted or it's not a good time, you can keep the rhythm going with, with the assistance of tools that have now been created for just those reasons. All right, thank you so much, everyone. Let me just quickly share my screen. Um, I want to... Thank you, our panelists, for joining today and our attendees for listening. Uh, this was a wonderful session. Um, I'd like to take a brief moment to invite everyone to our upcoming fall forum, uh, Depression Across the Lifespan. That is a three CE CME credit webinar featuring two individual keynote speakers um, and a wonderful panel. And if you are not yet an ADA member, I invite you to come and join. Our panelists can vouch for it being a wonderful experience. Um, you will have wonderful benefits such as uh, free access to CE webinars, access to our special interest groups and peer consultation groups and much, much more. And on that, I'd like to just give a final thank you 
Uh, Dr. Owens, thank you for bringing us all together today. Dr. Bianchi, Dr. Rigo, and Dr. Chapman, who, while he cannot join us today, is off doing the good work. <laughs> um, so we are so appreciative of you all being here today. Thanks again. Thanks for having 